June 6, 1944, was the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany in World War II, after five long years of terror and conquest. coast of France is beautiful and peaceful now. More than 40 years after D-Day, the biggest military invasion in the history of the world. I'm Lauren Green, and I want to tell you about Canada's pivotal role in the D-Day invasion and other important turning points of World War II. I remember those turning points. I was broadcasting the news to the nation during those days. I remember how the Canadian Armed Forces helped make D-Day the success it was. I remember how they went on to make the very invasion of Germany itself possible. It all began long before D-Day, back across the English Channel. Our story begins here, in England, where the invasion and its vital dress rehearsal were launched. But first, let me tell you why we were fighting. We were fighting to save our way of life. We were fighting to save democracy. By D-Day, much of Europe and Asia had been conquered by the German dictator Adolf Hitler and his allies, the dictator Mussolini of Italy and the warlords of Japan. Too many young people today have no knowledge of a man named Adolf Hitler. But when I was quite young, he'd become the most feared and dangerous man in the world. He and his Nazi party came to power in Germany in 1933. They sold the German people a dream that they could become conquering beasts of prey and rule the world. They organized their entire country for war, even their children. Then, in September 1939, they plunged the world into the biggest and most nightmarish war in history. And behind the lines, in secret, horrible concentration camps, they brutally murdered six million Jews and millions of others who didn't fit their notion of racial purity. They even slaughtered the children of their victims. Even though those horrible deeds were not yet known at the time, the news in the early days of World War II was desperate. German bombs terrorized London. Hope was hard to come by. Many young Canadians, like Jack Bernard, thousands of them, in fact, recognized the danger to freedom and bid farewell to their families to sign up to go to Britain's aid. They signed up to fight. But their chance to fight was a long time coming. First, the Allies were thrown out of Europe in an embarrassing defeat in mid-1940. The German armies defeated the combined Belgian, French, and British forces, and the Allies barely got away at Dunkirk, 
saving almost 400,000 troops. Then, in September, the German Luftwaffe launched the Battle of Britain. Thousands of planes attacked British cities day after day after day. The Royal Air Force tried desperately to hold off the German attackers and lost more than 900 planes. But the Germans lost two planes for every one the British lost. And by the end of September 1940, they knew they could no longer keep up the attacks. Until 1942, there was no real action for the Canadian Army. Morale began to fall a little. The volunteers and the public back home began to champ at the bit. They wanted action. They got it eventually, but it was not as satisfying as they had thought it would be. Wherever the action would be, the Royal Navy would have to carry the troops there. Suffolk House, near the Portsmouth Naval Base, was operations headquarters for the Navy, for D-Day, and its dress rehearsal. The Supreme Allied Commander, American General Dwight Eisenhower, made the decision to launch D-Day here. Today, it's a museum, with the war map preserved as it was on D-Day. The Allies had no idea if an invasion of Europe could succeed. After nearly three years of total war with Nazi Germany, they still had no experience with assault landings from the sea against Hitler's troops and defenses. The testing ground was to be Dieppe. Here, 6,000 troops, 5,000 of them Canadians, made a frontal assault landing on this heavily fortified port city. It was supposed to be just a large-scale raid. It was a large-scale disaster. From blockhouses on this cliff, and this was one of them, and from the other end of the beach, the Germans caught our boys in a savage crossfire. It began before dawn on August 19, 1942, and it began with bad luck. As it began, six enemy naval vessels spotted some of the landing craft. They attacked. The sounds of this sea battle awakened the German defenders. Within 10 minutes, they were at the coastal defense guns. The entire plan had depended upon achieving surprise. But there was no way to stop the raid now. The landing craft had already begun their two-hour run-in to the DF beaches. Six destroyers bombarded German positions. Then cannon-firing hurricanes flew in for a brief attack. But most of the Royal Air Force was busy trying to fight off the German Luftwaffe's counterattack. The RAF lost more than a hundred planes at the air twice as many as the Germans. At Dieppe, in the center of the landing zone, the Essex Scottish were pinned down on the eastern part of the beach. Many of them died in three attacks on the German defenses of the seawall. On the western end of the beach, beneath the ancient castle, the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry landed with more success. They broke through the German defenses. A few of them made it a little way into the town, but it was bitter house-to-house -house street fighting. The Royal Marine A Commando, when they came ashore, got no farther. The reserves, 
the Fusilier Mont Royal braved heavy enemy fire to land on the beach, but they too were pinned down. And to make matters worse, our tanks were late getting ashore. And once on the beach, most of them couldn't move. They couldn't get enough traction on the loose stones of the steep beach. By two o'clock in the afternoon, most of the 6,000 troops were lost, killed, wounded, or captured. The 2,000 survivors were on their way back to England. The raid was on its way into history. It was a sensation. First reports in the U.S. called it an American invasion of Fortress Europe. There had been a party of 50 American Rangers along. Later, they were happy to call it a bungled Canadian raid. The truth was something else. The Dieppe raid was supposed to test German defenses. It was not supposed to suffer such losses. Only half the troops made it back to England that day. If there was any gain from this disaster, it was the Allied realization that they needed to go back to the drawing board if they were going to succeed against the Nazis. After Dieppe, the Allies realized they had to play for time. Time to consider new strategies and tactics and weapons in fighting the German armies. Time for Canadian, British, and American factories to build the weapons to save democracy. Time to wear down the German war machine. Hitler also learned lessons from Dieppe. He built up his shore defenses. His aim was to create Fortress Europe. He wanted to make it impossible for anyone to invade the Third Reich's new European empire. He built the Atlantic Wall. It was supposed to make it impossible for the Allies to land an army. When General Erwin Rommel finished building his beach obstacles, the Atlantic Wall was formidable. had been at war for more than three years of victory and conquest. Finally, the string of bad news was broken. Allied troops under British General Bernard Montgomery defeated the German army at El Alamein in 1942. I remember broadcasting the national news that night. I said, there's plenty of news tonight, and most of it is good. This is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. The largest Canadian convoy of the war has reached Britain. Another German city has been blasted by the RAF Bomber Command. There are reports of a great naval battle in the South Pacific. Then in the fall of 1942, the Allies landed in North Africa. By the spring of 1943, they had handed the Germans their first major defeat. They took more than a quarter of a million German soldiers prisoner. Next, the Allies invaded Sicily, and then Italy. The 1st Canadian Division played a major and successful role in this campaign. In fact, among the first troops to enter Rome, only two days before D-Day, were elements of the Joint Canadian-American First Special Service Force, which was one-third Canadian. 
Just six months earlier, across Italy near Ortona, Captain Paul Triquet earned the Victoria Cross for his role in the Royal 22nd's capture of that town. Rallying his men when they were cut off at Casa Berardi, Captain Triquet and his men held out until they were reinforced. The Canadian forces suffered over 25,000 casualties in Italy. Nearly 6,000 of our boys died in the Italian and Sicilian campaigns. It wasn't until June 6, 1944, that the free world, or what was left of it, was able to turn the tables on Hitler. They did it on five French beaches. This one was codenamed Juno. Now today these beautiful beaches are marvelous playgrounds, but then they were no playgrounds. Thousands of Canadian troops stormed ashore here, and although much blood was spilled, the lessons of Dieppe learned at the cost of so many Canadian lives were applied with vigor and effectiveness. It seemed as if the fate of the world hinged on the outcome of that day. The Allied goal was to force Hitler to divide his forces by opening a major offensive against him in France and taking some of the pressure off the Russians, who were holding off three quarters of the entire German army. There had never been a seaborne invasion of such massive size before. There has never been one since. A major fleet conducted the pre-invasion bombardment. Where to soften up the Epp, there had been 30 minutes of fire from six destroyers. Now there were six hours of bombardment by a fleet of 120 warships, including two Canadian destroyers. The barrage was so heavy, the coast shook. Some German guns failed to fire a single shot. So disruptive was the artillery barrage. The Allies lost just two destroyers. The German Navy managed only an attack by motor torpedo boats. The RCAF's 439th Squadron attacked and took out of action three German destroyers en route to the invasion scene the day after the landings at Normandy. There was no Luftwaffe reply to the invasion until 85 planes attempted a raid. The Allies had absolute supremacy in the air. The Allies had 11,000 planes to call on to provide continuous air coverage. One Allied Liberator bomber, piloted by K.O. Moore of Vancouver, destroyed two German U-boats with depth charges on D-Day. Still, the troops had rough going. The seas were rough. Three and four foot waves tossed the landing craft about. Boat formations were impossible in some cases in the grim struggle just to get to the beach. Partly because they had achieved the element of surprise, and this was partly because of the weather, the Allied run into the beach was largely unopposed. But after the landing craft touched down, the German opposition became fierce. The German shelling and the mined and booby-trapped German beach obstacles claimed 90 landing craft. 
But by then they had already done their job. They put ashore the 7th Canadian Infantry Brigade, consisting of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, the Canadian Scottish Regiment, and the Regina Rifle Regiment. Tanks of the 6th Armoured Regiment, 1st Hussars, were to support the Winnipegs and the Reginas. Not all the tanks landed successfully. Many of the 1st Hussars had to swim ashore when their waterproof tanks swamped and sank. The B and D companies of the Winnipegs, assigned to the Kursal Strong Point, found the bombardment had failed to kill a single German or silence a single weapon. They had to storm their targets cold, and the 200 men did so without hesitation. Only Captain P.E. Gower and 26 other men from the Winnipegs were left when the strong points were silenced. The Reginas on the other side of the Purcell strong point were a bit better off. More of their tanks made it to shore. A company met strong opposition directly opposite a German blockhouse. The German gun got off 200 rounds before a direct hit from a Regina tank blew it out of action. But A Company had no sooner moved on than Germans filtered back in by tunnels and trenches and had to be cleared out again. D Company met disaster. It landed late. Several of its landing craft struck mines. 49 men made it ashore. At the other end of the Canadian beach where the 8th Brigade went in, the Queen's Own Rifles of Canada took the resistance nests at Bernier, and the North Shore New Brunswick Regiment captured a similar point at Saint-Aubin. At Bernier, there were 65 casualties as the troops landed. The German resistance nest finally fell when Lieutenant W.G. Herbert, Lance Corporal René Tessier, and Rifleman William Tchaikovsky rushed the pillbox with grenades and stand gun fire and silenced it. Some of the German beach strong points held out all day. The brigade's reserve unit, the Regiment de la Chaudière, had really tough going. Four of their five landing craft sank on the German beach obstacles and mines. Many of them had to swim ashore with only their knives for weapons. The first Canadians in France on D-Day were actually the boys of C Company of the 1st Canadian Paratroop Battalion. Their mission, which they fulfilled faultlessly, was to drop behind German lines and seize vital bridges across the Orne River before the invasion landings began. By mid-morning, there was an extra problem on the beachhead when the 9th Brigade, the Assault Division's Reserve, came ashore. Traffic, congestion, more men and equipment than the few roads opened up so far could carry. And all the Canadian operations continued under mortar and machine gun fire from hidden enemy positions. The result was that Juneau, the Canadian beach, was the second bloodiest beach of the five, with 914 casualties on D-Day out of 15,000 men who landed. Only the Americans on Omaha Beach suffered more casualties, losing 2,000 out of 35,000 men. At Utah and Omaha beaches, the Americans had put ashore a total of 58,000 American troops. At Gold and Sword beaches, the British had landed 60,000 troops. The Allies had everything going for the 155,000 troops in the first day's assault wave and paratroop drops. Superiority in the air and on the sea. And if they could keep the beachhead and use it to reinforce the assault wave of troops, they could have superiority in men and tanks. 
The weather, only marginally good, had helped the Allies achieve the element of surprise. But that didn't make it easy. The Allied advance was less than half of what the optimistic planners of D-Day had hoped it would be. A determined German army inflicted many casualties for every inch of France that the Allies won that day. That the Allies were here at all and seemed likely to be able to withstand any attempt to throw them back was the only victory they would get on D-Day. But as it turned out, it was all they needed. The Germans faced a two-army front, with the Anglo-Canadian Army on one side and the American Army on the other. Unable to predict where General Montgomery would attempt to push through, they had to defend against the Allies all along the 100-mile-long front. Montgomery adopted the strategy of attracting the German armored reserves to the British sector of the front, where he kept threatening to break through and push to Paris in order to weaken the forces in front of the Americans. There, the real Allied breakout would eventually come, Montgomery hoped. In his strategy, General Montgomery was helped by Hitler's stubborn refusal to fall back to better lines of defense, as his generals pleaded. In August, Hitler ordered his army to advance. As they attacked in the center, the Americans under General George Patton and the Canadians under General Harry Quirar attacked on both sides of the German forces, getting behind them to cut them off. The result was the loss of a major part of the German army and Allied victory in Normandy. This Battle of the Falaise Gap broke the back of the German army in Normandy. Less than half got away. After the Allies broke through the German defenses in Normandy, they opened up a front that extended from the Mediterranean and the Swiss Alps to the English Channel. This front was so big, it took not one but five Allied armies, 40 divisions in all, a total of more than a million soldiers with 400,000 of them fighting men to maintain it. Hitler had some 48 divisions, perhaps 500,000 fighting men who opposed the Allies. Some units had been severely mauled and weakened in the battle for Normandy, but there was still a formidable fighting force as the Allies were to discover. Hitler had three to four times as many troops, the rest of his army, on the Russian front. Now, an army depends upon a secure line of supply. The Allies were shipping supplies to the troops just as quickly as they could unload the ships in what few small ports they had captured undamaged from the Germans. But it just wasn't enough. By the fall of 1944, only four months after the D-Day landings, the Allies were beginning to run low on supplies all along their front. Some divisions had to be halted because of the lack of fuel. The Allies needed a major port. Antwerp is one of the oldest and greatest harbors in the world. The Allies had known from the very beginning that they would need this major port to keep their drive into Germany going. The German army realized the same thing. But before they could destroy the vital docks and cranes, the British army threw them out of Antwerp and stopped here at the Albert Canal, which was a tragic missed opportunity. The British had the port, but it would take more than two months and thousands of Canadian casualties to get the use of the port. Getting the use of Antwerp would require overcoming the heavily fortified island of Walcheren. 
It blocked the entranceways to Antwerp's huge harbor. The assignment eventually fell to the 1st Canadian Army. But before it did, the Germans had time to dig in six divisions of crack troops on and around the approaches to the island. After the breakout from Normandy in August, the 1st Canadian Army had begun working its way up the coast of the English Channel, liberating the port cities from the Germans and taking more than 30,000 German troops prisoner. This campaign culminated in the elimination of the Germans' mass terror weapon, the flying bombs, with which they rained terror, death, and destruction on the British people, starting right after the invasion of Normandy on D-Day. Stopping the V-bombs gave the Canadian Army troops a lot of satisfaction. But now, a new challenge, another turning point beckoned, Antwerp. Meanwhile, in August, a long advance by the Soviet Union's armies had reached Warsaw in Poland and ground to a halt that would last until mid-January. Montgomery still dreamed of a single bold strike at the Ruhr, the industrial heartland of Germany. But he also recognized there was a growing supply problem. He ordered the 1st Canadian Army, now under General Guy Simmons, to add Antwerp to their objectives. But Monty could not bring himself to devote his entire army group to the job. He dreamed instead of a single strong push into Germany using everything the Allies had left in a gamble for a decisive victory that would end the war. The Allies halted some divisions and diverted supplies to Montgomery. In mid-September, he launched a great leapfrogging airborne attack on Arnhem near the edge of the industrial heartland of Germany, to seize a crossing over the Rhine. It was an agonizing failure. The huge penetration of the German line fell just short when the Arnhem bridgehead could not be held. 2,000 British troops were able to escape, but 6,000 were lost. Arnhem had turned out to be a bridge too far. At the same time, fighting in the most difficult terrain imaginable, the Canadians set about the incredibly vital and difficult task of opening Antwerp. General Simmons determined that the dikes that created the island from the sea would have to be broken to flood the island and reduce the ability of the German defenders to maneuver from one point to another. Every canal became a line of German resistance. The Canadians made steady, but maddeningly slow progress. The German defenses had been thought out with great cunning. They lay in wait in defensive positions behind impossible water barriers, too shallow for amphibian vehicles too deep in muck for wading troops. At the center of their web of defenses was the still awesome island fortress of Walcheren. Refusing to guarantee the result, early in October, the RAF Bomber Command agreed to attempt to bomb the dikes. 
dramatic result was a 150-foot gap in the dike. The Germans had no hope of repairing it. They lost their mobility within their island fortress. But the German garrison's big guns still commanded all the entrances to the vital port of Antwerp. And German units were still offering stiff resistance on the flooded approaches to the island fortress. By mid-October, the situation was becoming desperate. General Eisenhower ordered Montgomery to make opening the port of Antwerp his army group's top priority. And Monty reinforced the Canadian army with British units. There were still some 3,000 well-supplied German troops and heavy guns dug in to defend the island. The island's conquest would take three more weeks of fighting deadlier than the D-Day landing itself. It was the end of October before the Canadian Army had gained enough ground to let Brigadier General Bruce Matthews bring his guns close enough to shell Walkman Island. It cost the 2nd Division's 10,000 fighting men 4,000 casualties to get there. The island's only connection to the mainland was a causeway that was 1,200 yards long and only 40 yards wide. Today, a new superhighway and a railroad run over that approach, and the industrious Dutch have rebuilt their dikes even larger than before. In three days of desperate fighting and heroism, the Black Watch, the Calgary Highlanders, and Les Maisonneuves succeeded in getting across. Today, no memorial marks the spot. Just the ruined German bunkers at each end of the causeway that took so many lives. It took four almost simultaneous assaults from four directions to take the island. There was an attack in storm boats under cover of darkness. An amphibious landing on the southern part of the island and a seaborne assault on the westernmost tip. The landings began on November 1st, the day after the 2nd Canadian Division began its painful assault across the causeway. The German High Command report on the loss of the island blamed General Matthews' artillery fire as the immediate cause of the defeat. By the end of the week, the Allies had the island. Against defenses stronger than those faced anywhere in Normandy on D-Day, the 1st Canadian Army had taken a strategic objective on which the rest of the war depended. Even though it was denied the priority it needed until the middle of October, and never got the air support it deserved. The result was that more men died to open Antwerp than should have been necessary. With the ancient and extensive port facilities of Antwerp open and working, the Allies could move forward against Germany again. The German generals had considered the Allied battle to open Antwerp, and this is, in their own words, as the decisive battle for the further conduct of the war. Well, they lost it. And six months later, the war was over. The 1st Canadian Army and its British reinforcements suffered 13,000 casualties in handing the Germans this defeat. Almost exactly half of those casualties were Canadian boys. But the Germans were not through yet. Just before Christmas 1944, they launched a massive counteroffensive against the Allies in Belgium, aimed at driving right through to Antwerp and cutting the Allied front in Western Europe in half. Allied losses were heavy as this German blitz rolled through their lines. But the German advance spotted out after about 50 miles when they failed to capture the American fuel dumps. They ran out of gas. 
trying to recapture the ground lost in the Battle of the Bulge, took until early spring, but it only postponed the inevitable. By spring, Allied armies were racing across Germany to meet in the middle. As they smashed the remnants of the once invincible Wehrmacht, they unlocked the gates of hell and the German death camps. A shocked world learned of the extermination of almost the entire population of German Jews and many others. As the Red Army of the Soviet Union fought in the streets of Berlin in April of 1945, Hitler committed suicide. Two weeks later, Germany's generals surrendered to Montgomery. The German delegation will now sign this, uh, this paper and uh, 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 they will sign in order of seniority and uh, General Admiral von Friedeberg uh, will uh, sign first. The free world rejoiced with a sense of relief that I can still feel. Today we sometimes overlook or lose sight of how great were Canada's contributions to victory in World War II. But consider, Canada raised an army of more than a million men and women out of a population of only 11 million. We floated a navy of more than 300 ships. It sank 29 U-boats. We built an air force of a quarter of a million volunteers. By the end of the war, all told, more than two million Canadians had served in the armed forces. Almost 42,000 Canadians had died. In the history of Canada's volunteer, citizen-soldier, military tradition, these turning points, the battles of the Scheldt, D-Day, and Dieppe, get my vote as some of their finest, bravest hours. Our troops went home the same way they'd come to England in the war. Their ships pulled out of Portsmouth, and other English harbors, loaded with boys who had been forced to become men and heroes and would now be expected to become civilians again. They had dedicated their lives to winning the war. A grateful country dedicated its resources to their retraining and adjustment. The ones who hadn't gone to war were three to five years ahead of the veterans in their schooling and their careers. The government, through the Veterans Acts, provided catch-up aid. Veterans housing grants and low-interest loans helped build homes. Government loans helped 140,000 veterans set themselves up in farming. Veterans rebuilt the country's fishing industry with government loans. Others needed medical help, psychiatry, plastic surgery, artificial limbs, disability pensions, even, in some cases, permanent hospitalization. The Canadian government set up the Department of Veterans Affairs in 1944, just in time to prepare for the return of the two million Canadian men and women who served in World War II. The Veterans Department's aims were to help them get reestablished and build a new and better life for themselves and their dependents. 
a new and better country would be created by these veterans. Today, the department's goals have shifted. They concentrate on the needs of aging veterans. The department's objective is to make certain that all eligible veterans get the health care they need. There are more than 700,000 Canadian war veterans. Most of them are over 60 now. They live everywhere, perhaps even on your street. When you meet a war veteran, ask him to tell you about the war. And I think he responds by telling you that he went to fight for freedom. That means he went to fight for you. And many of his comrades never returned home. They're buried in fields across Europe, very much like this one at Bendy sur mer And reading their headstones, you see that there were some who were older, but many who were 18, 19, 20 years old. Just boys. Brave boys. Still thousands more are buried here and in other cemeteries across Europe. But we have not forgotten our debt to them either. Memorial ceremonies by the Department of Veterans Affairs keep their memory alive, lest we forget. It's been a long time since World War II now. Sixty million people died in it. But there was no doubt on our minds that it was a necessary war, that we had to win. I remember how we rejoiced when it was over. Tyranny had failed. Freedom had prevailed. And that's why we remain faithful to the memory and the belief in freedom of those who died and of those who survived to come home and use that freedom. That's why they have our eternal thanks. That is the least we owe them. <laughs> 